Guglielmo Marconi. Guglielmo Marconi, first Marquis of Marconi, 25th of April 187,420 July 1937, was an Italian inventor and electrical engineer, known for his pioneering work on long-distance radio transmission, development of Marconi's law, and a radio telegraph system. He is credited as the inventor of radio, and he shared the 1909 Nobel Prize in Physics with Carl Ferdinand Braun in recognition of their contributions to the development of wireless telegraphy. Marconi was also an entrepreneur, businessman, and founder of the Wireless Telegraph and Signal Company in the United Kingdom in 1897, which became the Marconi Company. He succeeded in making an engineering and commercial success of radio by innovating and building on the work of previous experimenters and physicists. In 1929, Marconi was ennobled as a Marchese, Marquis, by King Victor Emmanuel III of Italy, and, in 1931, he set up the Vatican Radio for Pope Pius XI. Marconi was born into the Italian nobility as Guglielmo Giovanni Maria Marconi in Bologna on April 25, 1874 the second son of Giuseppe Marconi, an Italian aristocratic landowner from Parata Derm, and his Irish-slash-Scot wife Annie Jameson, daughter of Andrew Jameson of Daphne Castle in County Wexford, Ireland and granddaughter of John Jameson, founder of whiskey distillers Jameson and Sons. Marconi had a brother, Alfonso, and a stepbrother, Luigi. Between the ages of two and six, Marconi and his elder brother Alfonso lived with their mother in the English town of Bedford. Marconi did not attend school as a child and did not go on to formal higher education. Instead, he learned chemistry, math, and physics at home from mysterious off private tutors hired by his parents. His family hired additional tutors for Guglielmo in the winter when they would leave Bologna for the warmer climate of Tuscany or Florence. Marconi noted an important mentor was Professor Vincenzo Rosa, a high school physics teacher in Livorno. Rosa taught the 17 year old Marconi the basics of physical phenomena as well as new theories on electricity. At the age of 18, back in Bologna, Marconi became acquainted with the University of Bologna physicist Augusto Righi, who had done research on Heinrich Hertz's work. Righi permitted Marconi to attend lectures at the university and also to use the university's laboratory and library. From youth, Marconi was interested in science and electricity. In the early 1890s, he began working on the idea of wireless telegraphy i.e., the transmission of telegraph messages without connecting wires as used by the electric telegraph. This was not a new idea, numerous investigators and inventors had been exploring wireless telegraph technologies and even building systems using electric conduction, electromagnetic induction and optical, light signaling for over 50 years, but none had proven technically and commercially successful. A relatively new development came from Heinrich Hertz, who, in 1888, demonstrated that one could produce and detect electromagnetic radiation. At the time, this radiation was commonly called Hertzian waves, and is now generally referred to as radio waves. There was a great deal of interest in radio waves in the physics community, but this interest was in the scientific phenomenon, not in its potential as a communication method. Physicists generally looked on radio waves as an invisible form of light that could only travel along a line of sight path, limiting its range to the visual horizon like existing forms of visual signaling. Hertz's death in 1894 brought published reviews of his earlier discoveries including a demonstration on the transmission on detection of radio waves by the British physicist Oliver Lodge and an article about Hertz's work by Augusto Righi. Righi's article renewed Marconi's interest in developing a wireless telegraphy system based on radio waves, a line of inquiry that Marconi noted that other inventors did not seem to be pursuing. At the age of 20, Marconi began to conduct experiments in radio waves building much of his own equipment in the attic of his home at the Villa Griffini in Pontecchio now an administrative subdivision of Sasso Marconi, Italy with the help of his butler Mignani. Marconi built on Hertz's original experiments and, at the suggestion of Righi, began using a coherer, an early detector based on the 1890 findings of French physicist Edward Raleigh and used in Lodge's experiments, that changed resistance when exposed to radio waves. In the summer of 1894, he built a storm alarm made up of a battery, a coherer, and an electric bell, which went off when it picked up the radio waves generated by lightning. Late one night, in December 1894, Marconi demonstrated a radio transmitter and receiver to his mother, a setup that made a bell ring on the other side of them by pushing a telegraphic button on a bench. Supported by his father, 
Marconi continued to read through the literature and picked up on the ideas of physicists who were experimenting with radio waves. He developed devices, such as portable transmitters and receiver systems, that could work over long distances, turning what was essentially a laboratory experiment into a useful communication system. Marconi came up with a functional system with many components. In the summer of 1895, Marconi moved his experiments outdoors on his father's estate in Bologna. He tried different arrangements and shapes of antenna butte even with improvements he was able to transmit signals only up to one half mile, a distance Oliver Lodge had predicted in 1894 as the maximum transmission distance for radio waves. A breakthrough came in the summer of 1895, when Marconi found that much greater range could be achieved after he raised the height of his antenna and, borrowing from a technique used in wired telegraphy, grounding his transmitter and receiver. With these improvements, the system was capable of transmitting signals up to an overhills. The monopole antenna reduced the frequency of the waves compared to the dipole antennas used by Hertz, and radiated vertically polarized radio waves which could travel longer distances. By this point, he concluded that a device could become capable of spanning greater distances, with additional funding and research, and would prove valuable both commercially and militarily. Marconi's experimental apparatus proved to be the first engineering complete, commercially successful radio transmission system. Marconi wrote to the Ministry of Post and Telegraphs, then under the direction of Pietro La Cava, explaining his wireless telegraph machine and asking for funding. He never received a response to his letter which was eventually dismissed by the minister, who wrote to the Long Ara on the document, referring to the insane asylum on Via della Longara in Rome. In 1896, Marconi spoke with his family friend Carlo Gardini, honorary consul at the United States Consulate in Bologna, about leaving Italy to go to England. Gardini wrote a letter of introduction to the ambassador of Italy in London, Annibal Ferrero explaining who Marconi was and about his extraordinary discoveries. In his response, Ambassador Ferrero advised them not to reveal Marconi's results until after a patent was obtained. He also encouraged Marconi to come to England where he believed it would be easier to find the necessary funds to convert his experiments into practical use. Finding little interest or appreciation for his work in Italy, Marconi traveled to London in early 1896 at the age of 21, accompanied by his mother to seek support for his work. He spoke fluent English in addition to Italian, Marconi arrived at Dover, and the customs officer opened his case to find various apparatus. The customs officer immediately contacted the Admiralty in London. While there, Marconi gained the interest and support of William Preece, the chief electrical engineer of the British Post Office. Marconi made the first demonstration of his system for the British government in July 1896. A further series of demonstrations for the British followed, and, by March 1897, Marconi had transmitted Morse code signals over a distance of about across Salisbury Plain. On May 13, 1897, Marconi sent the first ever wireless communication over open sea. A message was transmitted over the Bristol Channel from Flatholm Island to Lavernick Point in Benarth, a distance of. The message read Are you ready? The transmitting equipment was almost immediately relocated to Breen Down Fort on the Somerset coast, stretching the range to. Impressed by these and other demonstrations, Preece introduced Marconi's ongoing work to the general public at two important London lectures, Telegraphy Without Wires, at the Toynbee Hall on December 11, 1896, and Signaling Through Space Without Wires, given to the Royal Institution on June 4, 1897. Numerous additional demonstrations followed, and Marconi began to receive international attention. In July 1897, he carried out a series of tests at La Spezia, in his home country, for the Italian government. A test for Lloyds between Ballycastle and Rapplin Island, Northern Ireland, was conducted on July 6, 1898. A transmission across the English Channel was accomplished on March 27, 1899, from Wimiru, France to South Foreland Lighthouse. England. Marconi set up an experimental base at the Haven Hotel, Sandbanks, Pool Harbor, Dorset, where he erected a 100 foot high mast. He became friends with the Van Raltes, the owners of Brownsea Island in Pool Harbor, and his sailing boat, the Elettra, was often moored on Brownsea or at the Haven Hotel when he was not conducting experiments at sea. In December 1898, the British Lightship Service authorized the establishment of wireless communication between the South Foreland Lighthouse at Dover and the East Goodwin Lightship, 12 miles distant. On March 17, 1899, 
the East Goodwin lightship sent a signal on behalf of the merchant vessel Elba which had run aground on Goodwin Sands. The message was received by the radio operator of the South Foreland Lighthouse, who summoned the aid of the Ramsgate lifeboat. In the autumn of 1899, the first demonstrations in the United States took place. Marconi had sailed to the U.S. at the invitation of the New York Herald newspaper to cover the America's Cup international yacht races off Sandy Hook, New Jersey. The transmission was done aboard the SS Ponce, a passenger ship of the Puerto Rico line. Marconi left for England on November 8, 1899 on the American lines, and he and his assistants installed wireless equipment aboard during the voyage. On 15 November St. Paul became the first ocean liner to report her imminent return to Great Britain by wireless when Marconi's Royal Needles Hotel radio station contacted her 66 nautical miles off the English coast. At the turn of the 20th century, Marconi began investigating a means to signal across the Atlantic in order to compete with the transatlantic telegraph cables. Marconi established a wireless transmitting station at Marconi House, Rosslar Strand, County Wexford in 1901 to act as a link between Poultu and Cornwall, England and Clifton and County Galway, Ireland. He soon made the announcement that the message was received at Signal Hill in St. John's, Newfoundland, now part of Canada, on December 12, 1901 using a kite-supported antenna for reception, signals transmitted by the company's new high-power station at Poldhu, Cornwall. The distance between the two points was about. It was heralded as a great scientific advance, yet there also was, and continues to be, considerable skepticism about this claim. The exact wavelength used is not known, but it is fairly reliably determined to have been in the neighborhood of 350 meters, frequency 850 kilohertz. The tests took place at a time of day during which the entire transatlantic path was in daylight. It is now known, although Marconi did not know then, that this was the worst possible choice. At this medium wavelength, long-distance transmission in the daytime is not possible because of heavy absorption off the sky wave in the ionosphere. It was not a blind test, Marconi knew in advance to listen for a repetitive signal of three clicks, signifying the Morse code letter S. The clicks were reported to have been heard faintly and sporadically. There was no independent confirmation of the reported reception, and the transmissions were difficult to distinguish from atmospheric noise. A detailed technical review of Marconi's early transatlantic work appears in John's. Belrose's work of 1995. The Polta transmitter was a two-stage circuit. Feeling challenged by skeptics, Marconi prepared a better organized and documented test. In February 1902, the SS Philadelphia sailed west from Great Britain with Marconi aboard, carefully recording signals sent daily from the Poldhu station. The test results produced coherent tape reception up to, and audio reception up to. The maximum distances were achieved at night, and these tests were the first to show that radio signals for medium wave and long wave transmissions travel much farther at night than in the day. During the daytime, signals had been received up to only about, less than half of the distance claimed earlier at Newfoundland where the transmissions had also taken place during the day. Because of this, Marconi had not fully confirmed the Newfoundland claims, although he did prove that radio signals could be sent for hundreds of kilometers, despite some scientists' belief that they were limited essentially to line of sight distances. On December 17, 1902, a transmission from the Marconi station in Glossay Bay, Nova Scotia, Canada became the world's first radio message to cross the Atlantis from North America. In 1901, Marconi built a station near South Wellfleet, Massachusetts that sent a message of greetings on January 18, 1903 from United States President Theodore Roosevelt to King Edward VII of the United Kingdom. However, consistent transatlantic signaling was difficult to establish. Marconi began to build high-powered stations on both sides of the Atlantic to communicate with ships at sea, in competition with other inventors. In 1904, he established a commercial service to transmit nightly news summaries to subscribing ships, which could incorporate them into their onboard newspapers. A regular transatlantic radio telegraph service was finally begun on October 17, 1907, between Clifton, Ireland, and Glossay Bay, but even after this, the company struggled for many years to provide reliable communication to others. The role played by Marconi Company Wireless in Maritime Rescues raised public awareness of the value of radio and brought fame to Marconi, particularly the sinking off the RMS Titanic on April 15, 1912 and the RMS Lusitania on May 7, 1915.
RMS Titanic radio operators Jack Phillips and Harold Bride were not employed by the White Star Line but by the Marconi International Marine Communication Company. After the sinking of the ocean liner on April 15, 1912, survivors were rescued by the RMS Carpathia of the Cunard Line. Also employed by the Marconi Company was David Sarnov, who later headed RCA. Wireless communications were reportedly maintained for 72 hours between Carpathia and Sarnov, but Sarnov's involvement has been questioned by some modern historians. When Carpathia docked in New York, Marconi went aboard with a reporter from the New York Times to talk with Bride, the surviving operator. On June 18, 1912, Marconi gave evidence to the Court of Inquiry into the loss of Titanic regarding the marine telegraphy's functions and the procedures for emergencies at sea. Britain's postmaster general summed up, referring to the Titanic disaster, those who have been saved, have been saved through one man, Mr. Marconi, and his marvelous invention. Marconi was offered free passage on Titanic before she sank, but had taken Lusitania three days earlier. As his daughter Degna later explained, he had paperwork to do and preferred the public stenographer aboard that vessel. Over the years, the Marconi companies gained a reputation for being technically conservative, in particular by continuing to use inefficient spark transmitter technology, which could be used only for radio telegraph operations, long after it was apparent that the future of radio communication lay with continuous wave transmissions which were more efficient and could be used for audio transmissions. Somewhat belatedly, the company did begin significant work with continuous wave equipment beginning in 1915, after the introduction of the oscillating vacuum tube, valve. The New Street Works factory in Chelmsford was the location for the first entertainment radio broadcasts in the United Kingdom in 1920, employing a vacuum tube transmitter and featuring Dame Nellie Melba. In 1922, regular entertainment broadcasts commenced from the Marconi Research Center at Great Bado, forming the prelude to the BBC, and he spoke of the close association of aviation and wireless telephony in that same year at a private gathering with Florence Tysak Parbury and even spoke of interplanetary wireless communication. In 1914, Marconi was made a senator in the Senate of the Kingdom of Italy and appointed Honorary Knight Grand Cross of the Royal Victorian Order in the UK. During World War I, Italy joined the Allied side of the conflict, and Marconi was placed in charge of the Italian military's radio service. He attained the rank of lieutenant in the Royal Italian Army and of commander in the Regia Marina. In 1929, he was made a Marquis by King Victor Emmanuel I. Marconi joined the Italian Fascist Party in 1923. In 1930, Italian dictator Benito Mussolini appointed him president of the Royal Academy of Italy, which made Marconi a member of the Fascist Grand Council. Marconi died in Rome on July 20, 1937 at age 63, following a series of heart attacks, and Italy held a state funeral for him. As a tribute, shops on the street where he lived were closed for national mourning. In addition, at 6 p.m. the next day, the time designated for the funeral, all BBC transmitters and wireless post office transmitters in the British Isles observed two minutes of silence in his honor. The British Post Office also sent a message requesting that all broadcasting ships honor Marconi with two minutes of broadcasting silence as well. His remains are housed in the Villa Griffini at Sasso Marconi, Emilia Romagna, which assumed that name in his honor in 1938. In 1943, Marconi's elegant sailing yacht, the Elettra, was commandeered and refitted as a warship by the German Navy. She was sunk by the RAF on January 22, 1944. After the war, the Italian government tried to retrieve the wreckage, to rebuild the boat, and the wreckage was removed to Italy. Eventually, the idea was abandoned, and the wreckage was cut into pieces which were distributed amongst Italian museums. In 1943, the Supreme Court of the United States handed down a decision on Marconi's radio patents restoring some of the prior patents of Oliver Lodge, John Stone Stone, and Nikola Tesla. The decision was not about Marconi's original radio patents and the court declared that their decision had no bearing on Marconi's claim as the first to achieve radio transmission, just that since Marconi's claim to certain patents were questionable, he could not claim infringement in those same patents. There are claims the High Court was trying to nullify a World War I claim against the United States government by the Marconi Company via simply restoring the non-Marconi prior patent. Marconi was a friend of Charles Van Rout and his wife Florence, the owners of Brownsea Island, and of Margarita, their daughter, and in 1904 he met her friend, Beatrice O'Brien, 1882-1976, a daughter of the 14th Baron in Chiquin. 
On March 16, 1905, Beatrice O'Brien and Marconi were married, and spent their honeymoon on Brownsea Island. They had three daughters, Degna, 1908-1998, Joya, 1916-1996, and Lucia, born and died 1906, and a son, Giulio, second Marchese Marconi, 1910-1971. In 1913, the Marconis returned to Italy and became part of Rome society. Beatrice served as a lady in waiting to Queen Elena. At Marconi's request, his marriage to Beatrice was annulled on April 27, 1927, so he could remarry. Marconi and Beatrice had divorced on February 12, 1924, in the free city of Rijeka. Marconi went on to marry Maria Cristina Bezzi Scali, 1900 1994, the only daughter of Francesco. Count Bezzi Scali. To do this, he had to be confirmed in the Catholic faith and became a devout member of the Church. He was baptized Catholic but had been brought up as a member of the Anglican Church. On June 12, 1927, Marconi married Maria Cristina in a civil service, with a religious ceremony performed on 15 June. They had one daughter, Maria Letra Elena Anna, born 1930, who married Prince Carlo Giovanni, 1942 2016. In 1966, they later divorced. For unexplained reasons, Marconi left his entire fortune to his second wife and their only child, and nothing to the children of his first marriage. Later in life, Marconi was an active Italian fascist and an apologist for their ideology and actions, such as the attack by Italian forces in Ethiopia. In his lecture, he stated, I reclaim the honor of being the first fascist in the field of radio telegraphy, the first to acknowledge the utility of joining the electric rays in a bundle as Mussolini was the first in the political field who acknowledged the necessity of merging all the healthy energies of the country into a bundle, for the greater greatness of Italy. Marconi wanted to personally introduce in 1931 the first radio broadcast of the Pope, Pius XI, and did announce at the microphone, with the help of God, who places so many mysterious forces of nature at man's disposal. I have been able to prepare this instrument which will give to the faithful of the entire world the joy of listening to the voice of the Holy Father. The asteroid 1332 Marconia is named in his honor. A large crater on the far side of the moon is also named after him. As of 2016 the Canadian Marconi Company and CMC Electronics no longer exist. Most bought up by Esterline in Ottawa. The Marine Service Group was acquired by Mackay Marine but many of the employees left the group at transition versus Tesla. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.